Good morning. 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 Welcome to the United States Sentencing Commission's public hearing on some of the proposed amendments for the current am amendment cycle. The Commission's hearing today focuses on three topics impacted by our recently proposed amendments, including the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, tribal issues, and the guideline that relates to acceptance of responsibility by defendants. The Commission appreciates the attendance of those joining us here, as well as those watching our live stream broadcast on our website. As always, we appreciate the significant public interest in the work of the Commission, particularly this year as we tackle the important and emerging, emerging issue of synthetic drugs. I would like to start by introducing the other members of the Commission. First, I'd like to introduce Commissioner Rachel Barco. Commissioner Barco is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy at the New York University School of Law and serves as the Faculty Director of the Center on the Administration of Criminal Law at the Law School. Joining us today by phone, Judge Charles Breyer is a Senior District Judge for the Northern District of California and has served as the United States District Judge since 1998. Judge Danny Reeves is a District Judge for the Eastern District of, Ken of Kentucky and has served in that position since 2001. Zachary Belatho is the ex officio commissioner from the Department of Justice. Commissioner Belatho serves as Deputy Chief of Staff and Associate Deputy Attorney General to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. Finally, um, Patricia Wilson-Smoot, the designated ex officio member of the Commission, represents the United States Parole Commission. Commissioner Smoot has served on the Parole Commission since 2010 and was designated as Chair in 2015. As we get started on today's hearing, I would like to make a brief comment about the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. The Commission appreciates the constructive comment it received from the Senate <coughs> Committee on Finance, the House Ways and Means Committee, and the House Judiciary Committee regarding the Bipartisan Budget Act and values their past and current interest in the topic. Through this hearing, we look forward to hearing from our expert witnesses on the three proposed amendments on the agenda today. At the end of each panel's testimony, the commissioners may ask some questions. We look forward to a thoughtful and engaging discussion. Each witness has been allotted five minutes for their statements. Uh, your time will begin when the light turns green. I know Mr. Caruso is familiar with this. <laughs> Yellow means there's one minute left, and red means your time has expired. Our first panel focuses on the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. Our panelists are Mr. Trent Shores, Mr. Michael Caruso, and Mr. Ronald Levine. Uh, Mr. Shores was sworn in as the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Oklahoma in September 2017. Before his appointment, he served as an Assistant United States Attorney in that district from 2007 until 2017. He previously served as the Deputy Director of the Department of Justice's Office of Tribal Justice in Washington, D.C., and has also represented the United States at the United Nations and Organization of American States. Mr. Shores graduated with a political science degree from Vanderbilt University and received his J.D. from the University of Oklahoma. Mr. Caruso has been the Federal Public Defender for the Southern District of Florida since 2012. He joined the office in 1997 as an assistant federal public defender and later became the first assistant federal public defender. After graduating from the University of Florida College of Law in 1995, Mr. Caruso served as a law clerk to the Honorable William Zlock, the United States District Judge for the Southern District of Florida. Mr. Caruso recently became the chair of the Federal Defender Sentencing Guideline Committee. Mr. Levine has served on the PAG, um, the Practitioner's Advisory Group, since 2012 and as chair since 2016. He 
He's currently the chair of Post and Shell's White Collar Defense Corporate Compliance and Risk Management Practice Group in Philadelphia. Before entering private practice, Mr. Levine spent 17 years as Assistant United States Attorney in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, the last four as Chief of the Criminal Division. We'll begin with um, Mr. Schultz. Good morning. Uh, members of the Commission. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to represent the Department of Justice uh, and also to represent my office, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office from the Northern District of Oklahoma and the men and women that, that work there. The uh, Department agrees with the Commission's proposal to enhance the guideline range for those defendants who face the increased 10-year statutory maximum provided by the Bipartisan Budget Act for Social Security fraud. A defendant faces this increased statutory maximum if he or she received a fee or other income for services performed in connection with any determination with respect to benefits under this title, including a claimant, representative, translator, or former employee of the SSA, or if the defendant is a physician or other health care provider who submits or causes the submission of medical or other evidence in connection with any such determination. The Commission has proposed amending this fraud guideline, Section 2B1.1, by providing either a two or four level enhancement for defendants who face this newly created 10 year statutory maximum. The department believes the four level enhancement is the better option. It would be consistent with other similar enhancements already set forth in 2B1.1. For example, four level enhancement applies to defendants committing theft of medical products while serving as an employee in a pre-retail medical product supply chain to defendants committing securities fraud while serving as a director of a publicly traded company or as a registered dealer or broker or as a person associated with a broker or dealer or as an investment advisor or a person associated with an investment advisor. And also defendants committing violations of commodities laws who are officers or directors of a futures commission merchant. These enhancements involve fraudulent conduct that we believe is comparable to that at issue today. Indeed, a fair argument can be made that the class of Social Security fraud defendants targeted by this act are worse offenders because they have defrauded a government program that is absolutely essential to millions of Americans. The department also supports the commission's proposal for a minimum level for defendants who face the 10-year statutory maximum, maximum under this act. As between the two options of a minimum of 12 or 14, the department supports the 14. Most of the defendants targeted by this act will be defendants with little or no criminal history, and thus even with an offense level of 14, they will receive a recommended guideline range of 15 to 20, 21 months. In practice, as you know, most defendants plead guilty, and when they do so, they will typically receive the two-level reduction and this would result in a Zone C guideline range of 10 to 16 months. So even with a minimum offense level of 14, many defendants, because they fall within Zone C, could receive a five-month sentence of imprisonment combined with some period of home detention as qualifying as a guideline range sentence. The Commission has also asked whether the addition of an enhancement in Chapter 2 would affect the availability of the level adjustment for abuse of trust in Chapter 3, uh, that's uh, Section 3B1.3. The Department does not object to precluding the abuse of trust adjustment if the Commission adopts the proposed four-level enhancement. The reason for this, uh, if the Commission adopts the two-level enhancement and then opposes the two-level uh, adjustment for abuse of trust, they essentially cancel each other out. And that would result in defendants receiving the same sentencing range as they do today. Such an outcome would be inconsistent with congressional intent as expressed uh, in the Bipartisan Budget Act, specifically Section 813 and subsection 813B, which talk about the, the increased penalties. Finally, regarding the conspiracy offense added by the Bipartisan Budget Act, Budget Act, the Department has no objection to the Commission's proposed reference to 2X1.1. I think that would be consistent with the Commission's typical treatment of conspiracy provisions. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share these remarks with you and look forward to answering any questions the Commissioners may have. Mr. Crusoe. 
Good morning. On, on behalf of federal public and community defenders, I want to thank the commission for allowing us to address our views both in writing and here today. And because we're here to talk about the Bipartisan Budget Act, I do want to start with, I think, our bipartisan agreement that we have no objection to the conspiracy offenses being listed in the appendix. Uh, I think that's where the bipartisanship ends, ends today. <laughs> but that's something, right? Uh, the defender's position, as we put forth in, in writing, um, both recently and in the past, is that we believe that 2B1.1 is already overly complex. And with these new offenses, we urge the commission not to add specific offense characteristics to further uh, complicate this particular guide. Uh, we believe that the interaction of 2B1.1, 3B1.3, and 3B1.1 all working together uh, in individual cases will allow the government and defense lawyers to advocate for individual sentence that fall within those guideline ranges. And we see that from the data. Um, for, for one of the, the offenses, there doesn't seem to be any federal prosecution for a significant period of time. Uh, for the two other offenses, the statistics show that there, that there are uh, sentences in, within the guideline ranges, I believe. One of the offenses has a 60% within guideline rate. The other, the other statute has a 40% within guideline rate. So that seems to demonstrate to us that, that the guidelines are working as they should be. Uh, as I read the material, not only from the Department of Justice, but also from the Office of Inspector General, it seems that there are other institutional uh, issues that may be at play that, that we think counsel uh, a wait-and-see approach given, given the amended statute. Uh, one, I think we would like to see before any change to the guidelines that the Department of Justice through Attorney Sessions and the individual U.S. Attorney's Office make these offenses uh, a priority given the significant conduct that's at issue. I think another concern is, you know, when we read the letter from the Office Inspector General, um, th there's an issue with the, with the loss range. I was taken when I read in the in the letter from OIG that they said in Social Security fraud cases the loss table is inapplicable. So I didn't understand what that what that meant. There is a footnote that describes not an inapplicability of the loss figure, but just um, that in these cases, the loss figure is too difficult to obtain. Uh, and so, so that is something that really can't be solved by an amendment to the guidelines. That is something that the Department of Justice <clears throat> and the Social Security Administration have to work on together, that when they bring these cases, they bring them in such a matter that an accurate loss figure can be given to the judge, because as we all know, the, uh, the loss figure largely drives the guideline range of 2 b one um, The other point I would make is that uh, the Department of Justice put together a hypothetical uh, in, in, their, in their presentation. And if you actually look at it, if you actually look at those guideline ranges that in their hypothetical, it gets quite high. In fact, it goes over the five-year previous statutory max. If you include, which, which they didn't in their papers, the two-level adjust, adjustment for abuse of trust or, or special skill. If you then account for perhaps a more robust loss figure, if the, party, if, the, if the governmental parties work on that together, plus the availability of an upward role adjustment, you are looking at sentences without credit for acceptance of responsibility almost up to the 10-year statutory maximum. So we think that given the institutional problem with these cases, that the guidelines should be allowed to work as the guidelines work. And if they continue to be a problem, the commission can readdress the issue. I thank you for your time, and of course, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Levine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I want to thank the commission for the opportunity uh, to serve on the Practitioner's Advisory Group, and along with my co or deputy chair, Newt Johnson, and uh, our ABLE members, we really value the, uh, the opportunity to give you some input here. 
We have written you letters on these topics back in February and October of 2017. Um, I'm happy to uh, briefly address them here and uh, take any questions. As to the Bipartisan Budget Act, uh, which increases the statutory maximum from five to ten years, uh, as described by uh, uh, my colleague from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, an increase in the statutory maximum, in our view, does not inevitably or even logically require the addition of a guidelines floor or a special offense characteristic. And here, uh, the Practitioner's Advisory Group, PAG, uh, recommends that the Commission not adopt either the additional offense characteristic or the floor. Let me give you some reasons. First, um, with regard to these offenses, we found uh, little or no research or empirical data suggesting that the guidelines calculations <laughs> fail to generate sufficiently lengthy sentences. And uh, as my uh, patriot from the Defenders notes, uh, some of the statistics would indicate the opposite. Uh, second, we think the guidelines already adequately address this particular subset of Social Security fraud cases uh, that are subject now subject to this 10-year maximum, precisely because 3B1.3, the abuse of skill trust provision, exists. Uh, it exists to further penalize, if applicable, the more culpable defendants who exploit their trust or skill to facilitate uh, Social Security benefit-related fraud, whether it's a translator using that skill or a physician abusing his or her skill and trust. And third, as already noted, 2B1.1 is already laden with uh, 19, by my count, offense characteristics, many of which have multiple subsections. It's already complicated. Uh, further offense characteristics contribute to a creep, a guidelines creep, uh, as noted, potentially very harsh sentencing ranges. Yet given the absence of data, suggesting that sentences are too low for this category of cases, we don't think the tinkering with uh, 2B1.1 is necessary. Um, I will add this footnote to these comments. If the commission was deter to determine that it needed to differentiate these new cases, uh, we would recommend at most only the proposed two-level increment uh, and make it clear it only applies to this subset of defendants, uh, the 10-year max defendants, and that if it applied, uh, 3B1.3 would not be applicable. At least, this would at least allow the Commission to isolate and analyze cases brought under the new provisions, use that empirical data to further tailor its consideration of offense characteristics to actual on-the-ground experience and demonstrated need. Uh, but that's a footnote. We don't think it's necessary. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions? All right, no questions. Uh, Judge Breyer, do you have a question? All right, okay. Thank you very much thank uh, you. for thank your you. presentation. Thank you. Um, both your written and uh, oral presentation.